with incentives that were hatched in Peru, this new internationalist smuggling class emerges, ever more professional, daring, financed, and elusive, much more um, organized than these part-time sailors who had begun the trade, um, uh, and a group that began actively promoting both new centers and cultures of consumption in Havana, in New York, in lots of Latin American studies, um, and um, linkages uh, to uh, what we're going to see as um, sources of supply in Bolivian coca base. Now the first place that was a hotbed of this um, Navigate. Just right. say it, I'll point. Chile, <laughs> northern Chile. Point to like around Valparaiso, if you can figure out where that is. Yeah, northern Chile, near Bolivia, okay? <coughs> Chile is not really a country that's known much for drugs, um, but in some ways, Chile was the Colombia of the 1950s and 1960s, completely unknown. It was the first major entrepot, it was the mobilizer of illicit cocaine, and in Chile, especially important was the very dynamic role of a particular family clan of Turcos. Turcos are Arab immigrants to Latin America. Um, they were called the Wasaf Harb clan. Uh, they were mainly located in Valparaiso in the north, uh, but they had extended family and political connections in Bolivia, uh, not only in Chile, but in Bolivia and also into the United States. And it's no coincidence that in the early history of drugs like cocaine, um, ethnic diasporas our pioneers in illicit drugs um, in Latin America. Not only did you find a lot of Turcos who were involved in this, but you found Jews, many of them Holocaust refugees, and uh, paradoxically on the other side, a lot of Germans who I suspect were um, uh, Nazi refugees uh, living in places like Bolivia. Now between 1950 and 1965, the Wasaf Har clan perfected and intensified cocaine traffic north despite much police attention or complicity um, in their far-flung networks. They pioneered a kind of Bolivia, Valparaiso, Mexico, New York route. Um, they had many collaborators along the way. And what they were doing was outflanking their own main competition, which were the Cubans involved in the cocaine trade. Now, in the mid-1960s, under US pressure, there was a breakup, a big bust of the Wasaf gang. Um, but what that led to was hundreds of other Chilean competitors jumping into cocaine money um, and thus making Chile the main cocaine corridor to the United States until the fall of democracy there in 1973. We'll get back to that point later. Now the second main intermediary or way station um, site for cocaine was Cuba. Cuba has a much more storied reputation for drugs, especially during the corrupt and hedonistic ambiance of pre-revolutionary um, Havana. It was a meeting ground of international gangsters under the Prio, Rao, and Batista regimes of the 1950s. And what's striking to me here in Cuba was the intense interest in cocaine by Cuban national mafiosos or merchants. There were a lot of gringo gangsters in Cuba at the time, but they were not involved in cocaine. Um, so cocaine kind of emerges as a Cuban national project um, with men like Mendes Marfa, Martinez del Rey, the Flaifo, if you can imagine, they're also Tur Turcos family, in developing a connection between Cuba, Havana, and Bolivia. And all these Cubans, there were dozens and dozens of these Cuban cocaine dealers in the 1950s, they all had these um, um, aliases, Apollos. They all were known in the documents as and Teminente, and Bicarne, and Loco Cubano. They're always, they always had some funny nickname that they used with each other. So throughout the 1950s, labs are popping up in Cuba for refining the transmission of this new Bolivian pasta basica de cocaína, which is a familiar division of labor now, um, and with its own um, uh, financing and own retail circuits. Moreover, Havana, um, which is, with its notorious sex and tourist clubs and industries uh, seemingly created the modern cultural taste for cocaine, which then spread outward from uh, Havana in a kind of a pan-Latin network, even into the United States, uh, something I like to think of as the Mambo cocaine circuit. 
well, there were all these kind of Latin music crazes of the same era. And they were the sites were exactly the same Latin clubs throughout the Western Hemisphere. So I think there's a really great PhD dissertation to be written about this topic. Um, nonetheless, in 1959 and 1961, Castro's dramatic leftist revolution marked a historical turning point in cocaine's evolution as Fidel, who was no friend to capitalists or gangsters of any kind, expelled the new cocaine traders from Cuba, making them more and more dependent on this very mobile money-making machine, cocaine, and creating a second Pan-American diaspora of career traffickers ranging all the way from Argentina um, uh, uh, into, as you can imagine, the heart of Miami. Okay. U.S. authorities, on the other hand, uh, quite disingenuously accused Castro of marketing cocaine, knowing exactly the opposite, that it was these rightist um, exiles who formed the nucleus of these cocaine trafficking groups of the 1960s. So the 1959 revolution represented a, a, a brand new stage in the kind of globalization and intensification of cocaine. Now, I'm going to um, speed up a little bit here, just pass over a little bit of other places. But beyond Chile and Cuba, there are a lot of other less central transshipment sites in Latin America. Uh, a lot of cocaine scenes that were emerging um, very liberally during this era. It was a very freewheeling era in cocaine's history. Each one of them is fascinating in its own scene, uh, own, own way. Brazil uh, borders Bolivia and Peru and was filled with kind of fun-loving cities. Um, Argentina had its own mafia groups that were uh, beginning to market cocaine during this era. And tango clubs had actually long been, uh, dating really back to the 1920s, a locus of, of cocaine use in Argentina. Mexico, uh, the Chileans used Mexico as a transit point, and so did the uh, Cubans. Uh, after 1959, and so uh, there's a very early history of Mexico being an entryway for cocaine into the United States, and Panama, uh, uh, which was a, uh, a meeting zone in the uh, uh, in history. Once I found this fascinating document in the archives about Panama, where the FBN is describing a new drug agent who they've secretly recruited in Panama. Um, and it was, his name was Ruben Blades. Um, well, it's his father, obviously. Ruben Blades' father was a policeman. And they describe him this document as the only honest cop in the entire uh, <laughs> country. I don't know whether that's true or not, but, uh, but it is uh, obviously his father who they were recruiting to do espionage or drugs. Um, anyway. All of these shifting channels of the 1950s and 1960s were, were new techniques and networks and alliances and risk evading strategies were being tried, perfected by this rising Pan-American class of career cocaine traffickers. Now, finally I want to get to Bolivia. Um, there it is, Bolivia. Good shot. Uh, you must have been practicing one of those laser tag places, right? Uh, is that what they do? It's wrong, right? I didn't want uh, <coughs> Bolivia. <coughs> Bolivia is the real growth pole of cocaine in the 1950s, the true incubator of illicit coca cocaine. Poor and chaotic revolutionary Bolivia. Have all of you heard about the Bolivian Revolution, 1952? Workers, peasants, students. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm getting, I'm getting a signal that you know about. Explain a little bit about it. Oh. <laughs>